My name is uh, Jim Garvin. I'm the Operational Manager for the Greater Faults Integrated Services for Children and Young People. I would like to introduce you to this uh, DVD, which is a history archive of the Falls area. This project came about through a partnership working between Integrated Services and the Divis Youth Project. When young people um, approach youth workers in the local area to talk about people who they look up to and would like to aspire to be, and they wanted to find out more about them. And youth workers thought this was a good opportunity for to put together a program where young people would learn a number of different skills, which would be film making, sound, lighting, researching, interview techniques, all the MR skills would help young people in their future careers and future development. Um, and the program then also allowed the young people to go and talk to a number of different people who grew up in the same area where they grew up, um, who went to the same schools that they went to or go to, um, and who have dedicated their lives to certain parts of uh, work. So we talked to Brian Kennedy, who dedicated his life to singing uh, and to helping local charities. Um, so that was an inspiration that young people had. There was um, a community worker who they approached and talked to about that their person who's worked voluntary in the community sector for a number of years and gave a lot back into the community. Um, and these were all inspirational people who came from the local area and young people aspired to be them and learn the skills and how they got into what to do. And uh, from that, their program, they will hopefully in the future become ambassadors for the Falls and give something back into the area because they know that a lot's been taken out and that they want to give um, positive, positive messages back into other young people to ensure that the Falls area um, and is seen as an inspirational place to live and come from. I was born in Pound Street, 37 Pound Street, which is the old Pound only, before Divis came about. We moved into Albert Street when we were knocking Pound Street down, 109 Albert Street there, just outside the door here. And then we moved back into the flats. From the flats then, or as we used to call them, the apartments, the city centre apartments. We moved from there up into Nansen Street and then into Grantson's, Grantson when I got married. So I'm originally from Pound Street, but I'm really a Divis lad. And my name is Frama Khan. I'm 57 years of age and uh, I'm an MLA, which means I'm elected uh, to the Legislative Assembly in the north of Ireland. Well, I was born in the markets area and uh, left there when I was about three and uh, moved to the falls um, with my family, my mother, father, uh, six brothers and three sisters. Uh, we lived at the corner of Jude Street and I was uh, raised there uh, from a very young age. Um, I went to St. Congol School in the front of Divis Street and later 
St. Peter's Secondary School, which is now Corpus Christi in Britain's Parade. I have a daughter called Lorna, uh, who's 23, who's a hairdresser, and uh, Jeanette is my partner. Uh, we've been together near 30 years. And that the, the, uh, they don't get, don't get to see me that much, uh, but most of the time at IRB out on constituency business or dealing uh, with events, political events up here in the Assembly. I'm the eldest of five brothers, Gerard, John, Tony and Martin. I had two sisters that were born in front of me, but unfortunately both of them died. I think one died at about a year and one died about six weeks after birth. At that particular time in the 60s, 50s, sorry, when I was born in the 50s, that uh, women from the area that didn't seem to be able to carry young girls, so I've no sisters. Certainly growing up in a, in a family that was very close, uh, but in the area and the community that we lived, you know, that was a very impoverished community, uh, that the social deprivation that existed, um, that, that was as, every bit as bad uh, as today and in many ways probably worse. Uh, but there was a very big and great uh, community uh, togetherness within uh, the area that I lived, uh, that uh, everybody knew of everybody else, but everybody, uh, everybody that lived in the area uh, would have been uh, in a high degree of poverty. Well, I was born in Nelson Street, which borders on Little Italy, back in 1954, when my mum and dad lived with my mum's sister. But I grew up in uh, Peel Street off the Falls Road and uh, my mum and dad had an elder daughter, Mary, but she died at two and there was me and my two sisters, Anne and Brady. And I've all, well, I, until what happened to me, until I got arrested in 1974, I'd always lived in the Falls. My father worked in the railways all his life, but he would have been in between jobs. He was a bit of a drinker, to be honest with you. Uh, my mother used to go out and clean the rares because if you were a man, she had seven girls, two boys to look after. My dad got the name Giuseppe, which is an unusual name for not just for anyone in Belfast, but for anyone in Ireland. And the story I've been told is that uh, my grandmother, my father's mother, helped out and worked in Raffo's chip shop, which was at, uh, in Divis Street. And that when she was pregnant, uh, Joe Raffo, sort of give her extra bits and pieces to take away at night and she said if she had a son she would name him Giuseppe after Joe Raffo which Joseph in Italian is Giuseppe so that's how he came about and my father came from a family of uh, him and his two brothers and three sisters my mother was uh, called Sarah Maguire uh, she was born in the Lower Falls This isn't the area I was brought up in I was brought in up on and around Leeson Street in the older type housing and it was, I'd say it was in a pretty poor area, quite like what we're brought down to now, very high unemployment. You were very limited with jobs and that, but I'd have said you had a better um, childhood. You hadn't as much, you hadn't as much things like drugs, w weren't big drinkers in those days. You remain children for a little bit longer than what they do now. You lived in a house with a two up, two down, with seven girls, two boys, my mummy, my daddy and my granny, with an outside toilet and you had no bathroom. And that's, and I'm not saying I'm different than anybody else in those days, that's the way everybody lived in those days. We all grew up in Divis, all played football for Immaculata, all tried to get educated and um, one's a water engineer. One drives a skip lorry, one has his own business and the other has it all in business of some sorts. So at the end of the day they all grew up in Divis, they all ended up good fellas and good jobs. In 1966 uh, my mother gave birth to me in the back room of the house in, in Armour Road, in uh, Walmer Street in fact was the name of the street. But very quickly after that we moved to uh, Beachmount where my mother was from. And I ended up living in Beachmount from I was a little, tiny little baby until I was I'd say 16, 17 years old. My granny lived in Beachmount Street. We ended up living in Clowney Street and then on Cymru Street. And I finally left uh, in the early 80s to go to London to try and be a singer. She would three sisters and three brothers. When she was growing up, she left school at 12. She went to work in the mill. She ended up working in a rag store, Cain's Rag Store, which was in Cypress Street. She worked there for quite a long time. And then she went and got a job in the hospital as a cleaner. 
my father had worked at the, the shipyard in his early 20s and they were doing red leading which is quite a serious job now you would get plenty of protection for your health because of the fumes and that and through working there he developed a, a bad chest and spent many years in and out of sanatoriums in White Abbey and at Foster Greens. Always lived in Belfast, brought up on the Springfield Road, Clannard area. My mother is Susan Rogan, Nee Quinn, and my father was Bobby Rogan, who lived in Ford Street. My mother's from Colinview Street, off of Springfield Road also. I have five brothers, two sisters, I have four sons and two daughters. I went to St Colles Primary School in Waterville Street in the Clannard area and the secondary school I went to St Paul's in Beachbound Parade and I enjoyed it, yeah I did. It had its ups and downs. First of all I went to St Peter's Primary School in Raglan Street and it was brilliant. It was like being in a cartoon. It was the best of times, you know. All your mates went there, you run about the exercise yard and you got milk and, and that. And it was probably the best time I ever had in my life. And then I went to St Peter's Secondary School, which was in, in the White Rock, just off Britain's Parade. And I was there for, from the age of 11 to 15. And it was okay, but I didn't understand the importance of education then. I went to St Paul's Primary School for Boys, is what it used to say on the badge on my jacket. And then I went to St Paul's Secondary School, which is now Corpus Christi. It became an amalgamation, I think, St Thomas's and St Paul's. Um, <clears throat> did I enjoy it? That's a good question. And it requires a very long answer, but um, not really. It was a very tough time, um, as you might imagine, the late 60s, right through the 70s when I would have gone to school. Uh, it was a very, very turbulent, dangerous, violent time and so therefore it was, I, I remember it being a very scary place to be, a very confined place to be. I mean the, the mantra was don't leave your area, you couldn't really go anywhere. Uh, it all seemed to be raining, there was army occupation everywhere of course and uh, we knew people that had been shot dead or, or maimed with rubber bullets or things like that. So it was, um, it was a very difficult place to just try and feel positive about. When we moved from Pound Street we had to walk across Millfield. Um, and we walked across Millfield at Unity Flats, there, which was the old Carry Kill. I can remember one occasion where we were attacked by a uh, Shankill Road crowd. And they actually stole my school books. That was one of the reasons why I probably left St Malachy's and had to go up to St Peter's. Because at them days you had to pay for your school books. You know, there was no, you didn't get your school books the way you get them now handed to you, you had to pay them. So that was one of, like, and one of the images I do remember from them growing up that there was always a bit of fear when you were crossing. You know, we couldn't afford the buses. You got a bus into the town and then you got a bus up the Antrim Road. But unfortunately, I hadn't the money for buses, so walking across that millfield was quite scary. Townsend Street, you just couldn't have walked across. Well, I used to go to Balkan Street as a primary school. It get demolished. I think you call it, I don't even know the name of that school, to be honest, no to But then I had the transitional period going to St. Louise's. When I went to St. Louise, it probably was only opened about three years when I went, when I started in St. Louise's, it was only built for three years. You know, I thought school was just something to lark about with, with your mates, didn't take it too serious. And I remember one of, one of the things that sticks in my mind, there was a teacher there, a history and Irish teacher called Kavanagh. And he said, if you don't get yourself involved in education and get an education, take a look when you're going home at how many men are standing on street corners who haven't got jobs you'll become one of them. It didn't resonate with me then, but it's always stuck with me. Growing up in Belfast, you know, the, the, that you could never skip a politics of uh, what Belfast was like. Um, one of the, my first experiences of that uh, was going to try and become an apprentice plaster uh, to a plaster's company in the centre of Belfast and uh, applying for a job. And they gave me an application form to fill in and uh, whilst they did not directly ask you whether you were a Catholic or a Protestant, uh, when you wrote the school down that you went to, they automatically knew uh, that you were a Catholic, and that was enough to stop you getting the job, and that's what happened. And I think so that was my first experience of, uh, of, of applying a job and uh, being become fully aware of the whole politics that was going on in the city at the time. It was desperately hard to try and find work. I, mean, I remember going down to a heating engineer firm in Corporation Street called Harbours 
and they had just brought out the law where you couldn't ask people's religion, but they got run that by asking what school you went to. And I remember applying and not getting a job and hanging about outside waiting while a couple of my mates who were to be interviewed were coming out and seeing these other guys come out. And they were absolutely overjoyed that they'd been employed. So my first job was to a message boy for uh, a hairdressing firm called uh, H.J. Christie's and College Muse. And I sort of worked for them for about three months. I left school at 16. You didn't have much options then other than leaving school then. Not like today where you have quite a few options because with your parents not working, poverty, I'd say poverty because that's what you lived in in those days. You had to go out and earn your keep. First job was as I say the engineer up at that Anderson Stein Nigel Centre. It was a careers teacher called Peter Christian from St Peter's who actually recommended me to a firm called Ulster Construction. This boy called Kevin Drain owned it, whose son now owns half of Dublin. Kevin Drain Jr. would be their wealthy, wealthy property developers. So my first job would have been up on the Anderson Stein Nigel Centre. I think I was getting £13 a week. My friends were on the dole, were getting £13.60. So I was working for less than, they were getting 60p a week more on the dole than what I first started off as an engineer. When I was young, it was very uh, usual for a father and his son to sign on the dole at the same time, on the same day, in the same office. So unemployment was just a fact of life at that point, serious unemployment. I knew a lot of people who were on the dole. In those days, you could sign on the dole when you were 16. Um, which is what I did. I left school and in that summer I signed on and you know it was a very depressing time because you think this isn't what I want to do with my life but I think when you're certainly when I was 16 I knew what I didn't want to do rather than what I did want to do but signing on was just one of those things that you could suddenly give your mother a little bit of money and and have a little bit of money to yourself for the very first time but certainly singing had started to really enter my life in a serious way then and I did daydream secretly but maybe I wonder what it would be like to sing. Well you had education a bit but not much. Your your jobs were very limited so I worked in a stitching factory which was very very hard work and I wouldn't wish it on anybody. I had a brother Billy, he's now dead. He would have been the first person ever to work in an office in the GNR railway because at that time when my parents and we were growing up there was terrible sectarianism in Ireland, henceforth you, why you got a civil rights movement. If you went for a job and you were Catholic, you did not get it. So it, that's exactly, and um, that is exactly what happened. And my parents, if they were here, would tell you that. So that's why Catholics always stray. My family, my mummy and daddy would have tried to educate you. Unfortunately, they hadn't the wherewith to educate their children. So we all were in menial jobs. Some of my sisters worked in the metal. I worked at the stitching. Our Billy, as I say, was the first one ever got into an office. Simply through, you had in the world with the educate your children. Well, I started roughly about 29. I started boxing. And I started off in a wee club in Pole Glass with Charlie Brown, which was only for like, a few a few days that I'd done it up there. I left there and went to Holy Trinity, Magalana. No, Magalana, Holy Trinity. They didn't want me, so I came back to Magalana. And Nugget Nugent gave me all his time. And My mother had two brothers who went to work in London when they left school, Paddy and Cuey. And he had left in about 47, and he helped reconstruct the the roads and the tunnels and the railways after the Second World War. And he settled over there and my Uncle Paddy went over there and, and worked over there. So from an early age I had been going back and forth, especially with my granny. Every summer she would take us to London, was, which was like going halfway across the world when, when you're young. You got on a boat, they took you from Belfast to England, you got a train that was eight or nine hours took you in. And then suddenly you were in this big metropolis with a multicultural society and you know I'd been going there and I'd been getting myself into a few scrapes here not with not only with the authorities but with the local uh, Republican groups and you know my mother used to say to me time for you to go over and get a job in London so periodically I would go to London work for a while 
come back. We went on this thing called Work Experience, 1516. I ended up briefly working in the stockroom of Top Shop in the centre of Belfast for one week. And I thought I'd worked really hard and there was all these stories of, you know, the boss sometimes gives you a bit of money at the end of the week because you're not really getting a wage or anything. So I worked really diligently and, you know, packed clothes and did all the things I should do. And at the end of the week, the boss called me in and I thought, here we go, this is it. This is going to be great. I'm going to get some money. And he shook my hand and said, thank you very much. And we'll consider you for the summer roster when the summer comes around and then said goodbye. So I left after a week with no money, no nothing. So that was kind of my proper first wee bit of employment really. After my mum died she left us a bit of money, 15 grand between three bro between five brothers. So everybody got three grand each and we decided to start off in business. We started off as builders. So we worked on the sites early morning to late at night and then we bought a few pubs and ended up with seven pubs but as I say, unfortunately, the banks have been sort of very cruel over this past while back there, putting people into administration, so we're still in business. It's building has been my life. Some of the different jobs that I've had, let's see, I, when I moved to London, I was a kiss -a -gram, which meant that someone would ring me up and I would go along to a hen party or something like that, dressed as, in this occasion, I was a crazy caveman, which meant that I wore leopard skin G-string and a little Tarzan thing and short hair and a big plastic club and I would chase the bride-to-be around the pub until she put the t-shirt on. I competed in the, the, the Olympic qualifiers for the Olympic Games in 2004. Um, I competed um, in Ireland versus Scotland. I've done all, all those. I also competed in um, Ireland versus America um, in Philadelphia where I met Joe Frazier for the second time. Um, so I went through a lot of tournaments to get where I got to. I think I had 30, 37 amateur fights in the space of four years, which is pretty good. Um, I captained Ireland five times. I have I won the Ulster senior, uh, two Ulster senior titles and two Irish titles as well. I should have had three Irish titles, but they're all my own. There wasn't a lot of inspiration around me when I was growing up because people were deprived of, of so many things that it was a, that it was a struggle. I, I I looked up to my father, you know, and I, I probably looked up to Harry O'Raw, who lived across the road from us, who was a docker, who was uh, you know a, a big man, and he was a, f a fair man in that door, and you know he was a generous man as well. Uh, uh, probably my teachers, some of my teachers as well, I looked up to. Uh, my grandmother, I certainly looked up to because she had this ability to, to run what they call clubs that would get people, you know, crockery and, and, and lino and, and different knick-knack and, and she kept the family alive and she was well known in the area, you know, as lots of people still say, you know, my Granny McGuire, when when it wasn't because she helped out a lot of people so my granny was a big influence on my life i think it was many people that that that, that influenced me and again many of them would be uh in terms of uh republican uh, leadership uh i happen to be uh, uh, interned and uh, i'm remembering in, in early 1972 uh i had uh, there was an old Republican that died, a guy called Squire McGuire. He was getting waked in a house in Galway Street, just off Dorm Street, and we were doing Guard of Honour uh, at, the, at the house. And uh, we were walking up uh, by Devis Tower, and a woman came running out of Devis Tower Crown and said, at that stage there had been eight people shot dead in Derry. And by the time we got round into the chapel, uh, that had went up to 14 and that, that day was bloody Sunday, so the, the, the end around there, not, not long after it, I was actually interned, and there's very few people uh, at your age realise that there was a prison ship in Belfast Harbour, down we would get the boat to England, uh, and I was on a prison ship there called the Maidstone uh, for, 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 for three months uh, during a term with them and moved along Cash. And there are people that you meet in places like that, obviously I was very young, and uh, I was influenced obviously by other people that I met within, uh, within internment and people that who would have formed the local Republican leadership that, at that time, I would have been influenced by them also. 
I was more inspired by ordinary people in Belfast to see how the, particularly the local women survived on basically nothing. Um, there was a great sense of humour and strength in most of the women that I had any kind of contact with. Um, so those kind of ordinary people would, would have been certainly early inspirations and I had a brief music teacher in St Paul's Secondary School called Mr Seamus Ewings and he was one of the first people who told me I could sing. I didn't know I could sing. And he said to me, you know, if you wanted to sing, you could. And when someone in a position of authority like that tells you that piece of information, it's different from just one of your mates saying it. You kind of think, well, maybe, God, maybe I could sing. So he was one of the first people to say something to me that I actually kind of believed. One of the things that happened to me in 1972 is that uh, myself and a number of other friends uh, went down to Cork as part of a, a rest period. And uh, we met Tom Barry. Uh, who was uh, a legend in Republican terms. Um, he, um, the, the, the IRA unit that he had uh, organised uh, w was uh, famous. As a matter of fact, recently they've done a, a, a film about it, and you call the film The Wind That Shakes the Barley, uh, that, that has been released recently. I think. But Tom, Tom Barry, and it was Republican leaders, uh, the likes of the people who signed the proclamation in 1916, uh, Tom Barry, Don Breen, Sean Tracy, people like that there who had get dedicated their lives uh, to try and remove British rule from Ireland uh, certainly were, were icons in my eyes. Nugget being my amateur coach who's about this height and he's a great guy, um, always in my head, always have the, in the middle of some of amateur fights, I cracked a few jokes in the corner during a fight, and Nugget used to say pre prior to we were going out to fight, hey, don't be cracking any jokes in the middle of the fight, man, right, okay. And then I won't do it. So this went on a few times, and then one day I think we were going down to fight in the All Irelands, and I took my, my boxing very seriously, but not too seriously because you have to enjoy it, so I enjoyed it my way. And Nugget enjoyed it the way that I enjoyed it too because he thought it was funny. So one of the days I went down, we were getting ready for the fights and I said to Nugget, but nobody's ever done this. He says, what? He says, I'm going to walk out to the corner and when the referee gives out the instructions and with touch hands, I'm going to go to the guy, Ula -ula -ula. and he won't know what's going on to make. I'm a head case. And Nugget thought this was so funny that I was going to make this mad noise. And then Nugget thought, I ain't dead on. So it was all forgot about. So we went out. In the, in the middle of the, the arena and the referee said what he had to say and I banged the guy's clothes and went -la -la -la. and he didn't know why I was from South Africa or West Belfast <laughs> but Nugget Nugent was in the corner banging the floor with laughter he thought it was so funny. Big hobby all my life has been playing football, playing football for Magalata I'm very closely associated with it, my son still plays for him, hopefully my grandson will play for him, I've one grandson now. I've been involved with Magalata a long, long time. So football would have been a big thing. Gaelic football, probably McDermott's I would have played for. But the Magalata has been a passion of mine. It's both junior teams, the kids' teams, where one of my best friends, Martin Foyle, actually runs the junior football. So I have a big interest in football and a big interest in Magalata and a big interest in the kids of the area. I played soccer um, and I played for the Magalata uh, Football Club. Believe it or not, that existed in them days also. And uh, so I, I played for them, but most of the time then, uh, you spent uh, your time playing football. And uh, again, uh, back in them days, uh, there was very little cars about, so you could get away with playing football in the middle of the street. And we used to play on Albert Street, mostly with uh, a ball made up of socks and uh, sewed together. I love playing football and I like playing handball. And as I got older, I liked backing horses, which I wouldn't advise anybody to do. It's a, it's a road to getting skint, but I love playing football. I play football every day, every single day. And from the minute I seen George Bass play, I wanted to be George Bass. When I was growing up, I was a classic asthma kid, you know, terrible at everything. I was a terrible runner. I couldn't kick a ball straight. I had banana feet. And uh, just not a very naturally sporty person, which was in sharp contrast to my family because my dad was a marathon runner and a coach. My brother Stuart, a marathon runner, also still is today. So yeah, I was, I was just really not, not a lazy kid, but I just didn't get the sport thing until much later on. I'm into fitness now, but then, oh no, and football, I couldn't understand an inch of it at all. 
I can remember many sunny days kicking an old football about the old Belfast City Council lights. There were an old steel lamp. I remember black in my eye one time when I run into it. Memories from the flats would have been made of football pits down there. The Macaulays, the Voiles, the McGuinnesses used to play football from early morning to late at night during the summer holidays. So with many happy memories coming from Divis Flats. I played Gillig and Hurling and I played a lot of games in the streets. Um, just enjoyed being around sports, which was fed in this from a young age. From a very young age, I supported Celtic. Uh, I, uh, from a, again, from about 14, I would have regularly travelled to uh, football matches in Scotland. And nicely, when I was 14, uh, obviously I'd had, have to be chaperoned uh, by older people. But after that, there, uh, when I had about 15, 16, uh, myself and friends used to travel, travel quite regularly. Uh, so I would say it's Celtic would have been the biggest habit I had at that time. Growing up through the Troubles, to be honest, uh, the, when you look back on them, there were, it was a scary time of everybody's life. But see, growing up through the Troubles, you see the, I'd say, comradeship where people in communities, where your neighbour looked after your neighbour. Nobody broke into houses, really, stole cars. And at, at, as a result of that, I think the Troubles being over, People don't look after each other anymore. I think the most serious memory growing up was August 69, when what's euphemistically known as the Troubles began. It was uh, absolutely terrifying to see people's houses on fires, buildings on fires, things that you were familiar with being destroyed, and the community being attacked, and being attacked by instruments of the government and instruments of the state. You know, uh, it had to be seen. My aunt lived in Conway Street, my mother's sister, and to watch her house on fire while trying to rescue some of the furniture from that has probably been the most distressing thing. Well, obviously it had a major impact on, on my life. Um, I was 15 uh, when uh, the falls and Divis areas were attacked. Uh, by by unionists and by the RUC, uh, not far from where I live now and lived then, that uh, there was whole streets that were burned to the ground. Uh, young Patrick Rooney had been shot dead in Divis. Uh, Trevor Q McCabe, a British soldier home on leave, was shot dead in Divis also uh, by by the RUC and B specials. Uh, I witnessed thousands of unionists um, going on the rampart page trying to get down into, uh, deeper down into the falls and Divis area, areas uh, to burn homes down. I've seen the, the burning remains of Conway Street, Cooper Street and Bombay Street uh, in the aftermath of that. And uh, I can, I, uh, the, the feeling of despair that there was uh, right, right across the whole area. 1970, I remember uh, in the falls, just in Albert Street there, uh, that the, the whole area was sealed off. Uh, that the, there was a curfew called by the British Army and there was 3,000 British soldiers uh, surrounded the whole area. It was saturated with gas. So there was a number of things happened uh, the, uh, the, the, in the run-up to internment, not least the, 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 the false curfew. But also, it, and, and after the curfew, when you went into 1971, uh, that the, uh, the, when internment eventually came in, um, my strong recollections of it was the whole community coming together to form, uh, to make barricades, uh, to try and ensure that the British Army uh, were kept out of the areas, to, to, to carry out arrests. Uh, out of th over 300 people who were arrested in the morning of internment, uh, there were very few of them who were actually active, active Republicans. I would say that internment, uh, what happened in six, 1969, uh, what happened on the 3rd of July 1970 with a false curfew and what happened on the 9th of August in 1971 uh, certainly shaped my uh, future life because it was shortly after that that I took a decision to join the IRA. Two of the worst bombings ever in England happened to be Guildford and Birmingham and the British police hadn't a clue who they were looking for. And what they did was they corralled Irish people and 
took them to police stations and instead of making a case against them, they made a case for them and they tortured people because they needed to get it into some part, kind of perspective. The IRA had launched a bombing campaign in 73, uh, primarily in London but throughout England and it had been a very, very successful campaign. But up until Guildford, or shall I say Caterham, there'd been no casualties. You know, I think in, in relation to the Birmingham pub bombings, in the 18 months prior to the 21st of November 1974, there had been 168 bombings, which had resulted in no casualties. And then on the 21st of November, the IRA left bombs in two pubs to kill 21 people. There was a unit that had been sent over that became known as the Balcom Street people. And they were sent over, and I think, and part, this is only my personal view, that they were sent over and their mission was to either continue until you're killed or continue until you're caught. And they caused absolute mayhem. They terrified. They absolutely terrified and petrified the Brits. I think that it was the worst thing that Londoners had experienced since the Second World War when Hitler was sent over the doodle box. And the British police had no idea who they were and they were never close to catching them. So it was a question of get somebody, get anybody and get them convicted to restore confidence in the police. And, that, and then in 74, on the 30th of November, we were living in 32 Cypress Street, the front door was kicked in. Soldiers came up the stairs and I was woken to the point of a gun facing me and uh, four soldiers and one policeman. And they asked me my name, I told them my name and they dragged me out of the bed. They told me to put on my jeans and my shoes and my shirt and they dragged me down the stairs. And they threw me in the back of an army personnel carrier. And I was lying face down and they were kicking me and stomping on me. And they took me to Mulhouse Street Police Station where they took me into this little office where the police, where the IUC were at the time. And they left me there handcuffed. 20 minutes, half an hour later, two policemen came in, introduced themselves to the desk sergeant, took me, hooded me, took me from uh, Mulhouse Street and brought me to Springfield Road, where they put me in a cell. It must have been about six o'clock, half six in the morning. And I remember the two of them saying he's to speak to no one and no one's to speak to him. And because I'd been a bit of a thief when I was growing up, I, you know, it was hard to get a job and I was pretty good at stealing things out of shops, which again, I wouldn't recommend to people. It's not, it's not the right thing. But that was the situation back there. And, you know, and I, I, I found myself in Springfield Road Police Station wondering what, you know, what had gone on. And I knew I hadn't done anything serious. So it was a little bit troubling to, to know that they were using this type of tactics against me. And then at one o'clock in the morning, the door opened and two policemen were standing in the door. One was a small guy and the other one was a huge guy. And they introduced himself as Detective Chief Constable, or Detective Chief Superintendent Cunningham. And the other one introduced himself as Detective John McCall. And they asked me my name and I told them my name. They said that I know Paul Hill. And I said I knew a Benny Hill. And I was punched in the face and they broke my nose and the clothes I was wearing on started to become saturated in my blood. They told me that to think about why they'd done that, they'd be back in 10 minutes. And I was to think about why I was there. They opened the door, they took, took me out, came back, on my call, came back on his own, he took me out, took me down this long corridor, past the desk sergeant, <coughs> up two flights of stairs into Springfield Road. We turned left, we went down to the, the, the interrogation room that was directly facing me, and then there was Cunningham, but he was also with two other policemen. He was with two English policemen. Saul Grundy, and he was a chief and superintendent as well, and the other one was a detective sergeant called Jeremy. And they proceeded to ask me questions about a bombing that had happened in Guildford, and I couldn't help them because I, you know, I wasn't part of the Republican movement or the Republican struggle. I'd went to England to work, you know, and, and I didn't have a clue what they were talking about. And they started beating me. They stripped me naked. They put me in a search position started grabbing my testicles, twisting them, kicking me, slapping me, punching me in the kidneys. And that, and then they just went on for about two hours and I, I, I couldn't understand why this was happening. And I kept saying, well, you know, check me out. I've never been in trouble except for stealing. You know, I'm certainly not a Republican. The IRA wouldn't help me. And they took me back to the cell. 
They left me there. They came back about eight or nine o'clock the next morning. They took me up the stairs, and I remember Cunningham getting me by the ear and twisting me by the ear and taking me to the the window to look out in the Crocus Street. And he said a couple of weeks previously we threw a guy at this window, and the guy was called Eddie Rooney. Who happened to know? And he says, and if you don't cooperate, we're going to throw you out the window. So I mean, for the ne then they they continued beating me again. They handcuffed me, they hooted me, they took me to Belfast Airport, Aldergrove. They flew me from Aldergrove Airport to, to Heathrow. They took me off the plane, they hooted me again. They took me to a police station called Adelstone. And when we arrived at Adelstone, it was snowing. There was little flurries of snow coming down and the, the orange sodium lights. And there was a gauntlet of policemen. And as I walked through, they were calling me every abusive name under the sun. Kicking me, spitting me, slapping me, punching me. Marched me up to the desk, sergeant's desk, formed a semicircle all around me, stripped me naked, spat on me, terrified me, kicked me, and then they dragged me down to this little cell at the end of a corridor, four cells there were. And in the cell there was no windows, and the snow was coming in, and there was only a concrete bench. And they sent me, they said to me, right, this is where you are. So I sat down on the bench, ten minutes later they came down, pulled the hatch down, told me to stand up. So anyway, they went away and I, I lay down and tried to make myself as small as possible. They came back and the next thing it was shouting abuse, calling me everything, pointing shotguns in through the hatch, telling me to stand up, sit down, stand up, do press ups, do burpees, do star jumps. And this went on the whole night, this went on the whole night. I, I came from uh, a very strong Republican community uh, where resistance uh, to all things, uh, the British Army uh, w w w was very high. Um, that the barricades after internment remained up for a fairly lengthy period of time. That uh, the British Army continued to try uh, incursions into the Falls area. And uh, w w what happened was that as a young person, uh, that all young people within the area uh, r fought and resisted that. Uh, obviously that had consequences and many young people were injured but we also seen that there were quite a number of people uh, who in, in areas uh, had been shot dead uh, during, during the, the, the internment period but there was a, a great bond had gathered uh, with, with the community and I think the whole community stood against uh, the, the, certainly the British military authorities uh, and when they invaded the area. I think when you're a young person and you are suddenly in the midst of what we call historically the troubles even though you know as far as I'm concerned I grew up in the middle of a war um, and also just by the the definition of being a Catholic boy that immediately politically defined me whether I liked it or not so I have very strong memories of even if I wanted to go into the city centre from here even from this building in Clonard you know you'd walk all the way down of course we didn't have any money for a taxi so you'd walk all the way down but then you were suddenly um, stopped by a, literally a physical barrier of railings and the men queued up on one side and the women queued up on the other and there was a turnstile and so the army would search you, ask you questions, where you're going, where you're, what time you're coming back at, what your address is, all of that. So it was a kind of, without exaggeration, it was more like a ghetto experience where you literally were hemmed in and you had to queue up and whatever the weather was, whether it was lashing rain or not, and this included pregnant women with their little babies and all of those things. Um, so I think those things affect your confidence, they affect uh, you know, your place in the world and confidence I think is a huge thing when you're a young person. So therefore when you would get past the barrier and then you're confronted with say a huge big shopping centre like Anderson McCauley's which was kind of a posh shop, I just didn't have the confidence to go inside because I felt like I didn't belong and I think those feelings of not belonging come from literally somebody saying to you, well you're a Catholic, you're not, you're not a worthwhile human being and you have to queue up and be searched like a criminal before you get into a shop before you're allowed into the centre of town, where you don't really have any money to spend anyway, but you just want to go into the centre of town. So I think that uh, was a difficult barrier to get across. It's probably normal because we're not used to that. The sound of gunfire and explosions were all, all the time, every day in life. So it was becoming normality to, to live in that. So this is sort of a, as much as this is normal now, it was harder to come from what we thought was normal into something that was really quiet, which we thought was abnormal, so work out one out.
you know, people were people just had the most wonderful sense of humour in the Falls Road, you know. Uh, I a guy I seen a guy called Philly McGee, who was a great friend of mine. He's dead now, God have mercy on him. You know, in the middle of a riot, dressed as a Russian diplomat, it was snowing with a fur coat and a fur hat and dark glasses on, put his hand up. And it's not funny, he got his finger shot off. But at the time it's funny, it's like when someone catches their finger in the door, you laugh. You know, and that was a strange sight to see this guy with sunglasses, a fur coat, a fur hat on, trying to stop the British Army by holding his hands on him. There are a number of events, as I said, that, that have shaped uh, my life, not only internment, not only the, the experience of was demolition, uh, but probably uh, I was always also on the blanket protest that led to the hunger strike in 1981. And after that, after that, I was when I was released, uh, I done quite a lot of travelling and having to set up. Uh, so myself and a number of other people, including uh, Chips Fusco uh, and others, went in and helped to organise uh, Sinn Féin within the, uh, the, 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 the Falls area. Um, in 1982, I believe, that the first Sinn Féin councillor in 80 years uh, had been elected uh, to Belfast City Council. Alex Mosca, followed close behind that by Sean McKnight. And in 1985, I was chosen by Sinn Féin to stand in the Falls area and uh, the, in the council elections, but didn't get elected. Um, was to the Mayanoids and the people that, that had helped and worked uh, to try to get me elected. But uh, I was elected in 1887 uh, in a by-election, and as I remained in the council uh, from uh, 1987 through to uh, just before Christmas. So it was a, a very hard uh, battle. It was actually a battle of day. You know, you went down and to go to meetings and the units had locked the doors. You had to kick the doors open to get into the meetings. You end up physically fighting with them uh, because they were spraying air freshener around you. Because they anyway, back there, Havels and West Belfast and Fenian scum. and um, So there, 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 there was a whole period in there. And uh, what I always uh, have said, especially in recent times, you know, you don't go into places like that to make enemies. You go in to make friends or build acquaintances. But it's only built by building friendships and acquaintances that you can actually achieve some of the things uh, that, that we have achieved. The building firm probably went for over 25 years. It would have worked in all parts of the north. Um, it probably would have employed a number of prisoners and ex-prisoners from particularly well, the Republican background. Um, it worked uh, Larne, Armagh, Newry, all over the show. We've actually left a number of buildings, like this building here is a Marine Chain Centre. We built it. Turned professional, uh, turned professional in 2004 and I trained very, very hard to try and get somewhere because I didn't know jumping from amateur into professional and especially being that I shouldn't have been doing any of them because I was too old and everybody thought I was too old, but I didn't. And I went in that, and the, the praise fader was my last, in my, in my head, it was my last go. I had to win praise fader or I was going to just finish off because it was the chance of a lifetime to, to win it. How did it feel? I don't know what it feels like to be a world champion, but that felt very close to it. No, it was, it was a great fight, a great experience, especially the fight, um, Matt Skelton, who at that time was world number six. And I knew that he was, what do they call him, the big ugly bear. The bear, that's his name anyway. And I knew getting into the fight that it was going to be rough and hard and I knew he was going to give me all, but I knew that the Clannard Cyclone would come through. So I gave him all that he wanted and I knew that I was starting to hurt him, especially being two stone lighter than him, over two stone lighter than him, that I was hurting him. And when I say they give me more and more to get up and do it, especially being um, from Clannard and from West Belfast and from Boxner to Magalada and the Lower Falls, all that all gathers in your head and your, your, your kids all gather in your head that you want it more. So as other, other people growing up like yourself, Growing up will achieve better in what they do with just believing in it. So, but it was a great, great moment that the lift the Commonwealth title, a second ever person from here ever to do it.
Unfortunately, the first time around, um, I didn't see it in the, the in the light that everybody else may have seen it. I seen it in a different light. Um, there was a lot of speculation going on about the fight should have been stopped. I believe it should have been stopped. I don't think it should ever have lost. Um, but unfortunately, on that occasion, and many others that other Irish fighters have experienced, that when you're up against um, England, English judges, then you're going to be the undercard, even more so um, the fact that you're the champion of anyway, you're still going to be an underdog. So it was, a, it was hard to take in. I was a lot going through my mind because I had already been asked not, not to fight because I had a, a very serious injury to my neck, which I knew way before it, that, that the injury was that bad that I could have ended up paralysed if I got caught hard enough in the fight. So it was locked up through my head and I'd already been asked by umpteen people just to pack box in because the injury was that bad. But um, I just continued on because I believe they could knock him out in six rounds. And you're done it in five. The music industry is ongoing for me. You know, I, I feel like I'm only really getting started. But thus far, I'm 10 albums in. I'm two novels in. I'm doing a series of concerts this week in the city centre of Belfast. So um, there are too many memories to, to select one or two. But certainly, uh, I remember very acutely standing on stage with Van Morrison at the City Hall. Bill Clinton switched on the Christmas lights with his first lady, Hillary, then. And that was a moment to stand in that T-junction and see a mass gathering for a really positive reason rather f than for an anniversary or a death or a protest. It was one of the first gatherings I was ever at in our city that was for a really, really, really exciting, positive reason. George Best's funeral was um, a bittersweet experience really because of course it was unbelievably sad that he had succumbed to that disease that we call alcoholism. And uh, at the same time I felt so proud to be asked to be part of the soundtrack of that man's celebration of his life um, and also in Stormont that building that was so defining for all of us you know in terms of our history and political decisions and everything for me to stand up there and look out into that audience and have George's coffin right there and also in my peripheral vision I could see George's son and his dad and then he was the missing generation in the middle there and then look out and see all of our politicians and sports people and all of those people that shaped this part of the world and then my voice ringing around that building and I suppose my accent in the sense that I started off on the Falls Road and here was a moment where I'm sending out that song You Raise Me Up. It was written by Brendan Graham, the words, and the music by Ralph Loveland from Secret Garden. And Georgie's family had asked me to sing Vincent, that beautiful song, first of all, because it was one of Georgie's favourite songs. And then, of course, You Raise Me Up is just one of those songs that seems to be emotionally appropriate for a very happy occasion or a very sad occasion. And so because the passing of George was, was so sad that it seemed to be the right song. When I am down and oh my soul so weary When troubles come and my heart burdened be Then I am still and wait here in the silence until you come and sit a while with me. You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I am on your shoulders. You raise me up to more than I can be. It's a wee bit high, but that's all right. Up at Corpus Christi now, at St. Peter's, that um, they had a, a Christmas place. As I say, one was Scrooge, where um, I got a part as a child. It was so successful that we got a, a key. We had to go over to Queen's University for two weeks to get trained. And there would have been bigger opportunities there. But at the time, when you're 16, 17, doing your levels, acting's the last thing you want to do. I was waiting in Liverpool saying to me, and I ended up maybe going over to Queen's and being an actor. I took a wrong career path. I got an opportunity from another West Belfast man called Pierce Elliott. And Conor Carmichael was in a show called Paula Moves 
and just by chance because I was a boxer and I was good looking and I had everything go for me. They wanted me in the, in the, in the show as a star one, you know. But Pierre Sally gave me an opportunity. I went for an audition, never done acting before in my life. Went for it and the, the guy that was dragged in it liked, liked what he seen and I got the part. And from there, I'd done loads and loads more. I'd done the film Man About Dog. I'd done um, Walking for Vinnie Jones and Johnny Was. I'd done loads of numerous things. I fought the law and so on and so on. I've been very lucky to meet extraordinary people. I mean, Van Morrison comes to mind immediately because he is also from Belfast and is a worldwide phenomenon in himself. So he stands out. And then as a consequence of that, I got to meet... In Van's company, I got to meet with, uh, let's say, Robert De Niro. That was an extraordinary thing to have dinner with him, and Van, and Kate Bush, and amazing people like that. So I could, I could go on and on, to be honest. But I think there may be two good ones. And Joni Mitchell, it's my other favourite thing. I've, I've met plenty of actors. I've met quite a lot of footballers. Uh, friendly with a lot of singers, and that. Uh, but I think probably the most undervalued probably by herself semi-famous person is Gareth Pierce and sister Sarah Clark who were phenomenal phenomenal campaigners for human rights especially for the Irish in the 70s and 80s in England and and still still is today and you know it, it, it's a privilege to to work with Gareth Pierce on trying to help people get out of Guantanamo Bay who are still stuck in there you know so Gareth Pierce would probably be the most famous human rights person that I've met and become friends with. I think the probably one of the most f famous person who I've met, who's, who I would regard as a real person and a good person and a sincere person is Johnny Depp. You know, we became friends about phew, 20 years ago. We're still in touch, we still hang out. He doesn't uh, play on his fame. He's very generous to charities, he's very generous with his times and he's very loyal to his friends. You know, a lot of them, uh, it's say, hey, look at me, Johnny Depp is the opposite. He dresses down instead of dresses up and he's just, just a beautiful man. Look, there's many people like I've met over the years. Um, Coleman Rooney I met, uh, would have been a businessman from down in Uri. Um I've met Martin O'Neill, he was at some allegations when I was there manager of Aston Villa. There's been numerous peoples. I've met the President of the United States. I've met uh, the, his wife uh, on a couple of occasions also. I've met the President of Ireland. I've met the Prime Minister of England. I have in my life uh, met quite a number of people uh, and the act uh, actors, uh, politicians, trade unionists, uh, because I had done quite a lot of travelling. Uh, around parts of the world in the early days setting up committees uh, to deal with uh, the, the prison protests that were going on at that time. So I'm probably fortunate enough to have met uh, qu quite a number of people. Pip was just an amazing funny guy, I mean a really really down to earth guy and he, and, and he came from a poor background such as we came, came from. So there was always that empathy, there was always that camaraderie, there was always that understanding and you know when I met him he was he, he, was, he must have been about 11 stone, 11 and a half stone. And when I was introduced and, and they said, this is the guy who's going to play your dad. I thought, man, you're going to have to lose some weight to play my dad. But he ended up, you know, he did lose the weight. And then he, he came and he spent a lot of time with my sister Anne and my mum going through my father's, you know, little idiosyncrasies and, and little quirky ways and stuff like that. And he, he just became a real, real good guy. And Pete was, a, Pete was a real political activist in his own right. You know, he, he was against, you know, he, 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 was, he supported the, the people who were campaigning about climate change. He was involved in, uh, in trying to help people here in Ireland. He was involved in, in helping charities and uh, local uh, issues within his own community. And, that, and he was just a real, real good guy. And... You know, I was amazed. I, I was amazed. And he, and he was also very generous with his time, which is probably the most important thing in life. People who, who are generous with their time. Well, we've met Fra, Jerry Adams, Alex Atwood. A couple of, you get a couple of people in from UTV, but if you're talking on the wider scale of, 
you know, like a president or something, no? Well, I got to know Daniel quite well. And he's a, he's a method actor. By that, uh, I mean, he comes and he studies you. You know, he interrupted a lot, of, a lot of parties I was going to and a lot of fun I was having by doing this. He would turn up at six o'clock in the morning and knock the door and get me up and just sit and talk because he wanted to, to get a feel of who I was and, and what I was about. And he, he, he's a really, really, really good guy. And I think that Daniel and his teens had a bit of a checkered past, such as my own. And he could empathise with me. But we hung out for quite a while. We went down to uh, Connemara to meet his sister, uh, Tamsin, who's a cook on TV and that there. And he was a very, very kind, very generous, very warm guy. I was a little bit concerned that there, there was a guy here who was near the same age as me, or four or five younger, years younger than me, that was going to play me at 20. But he, Daniel is a, you know, he's a tremendous actor and he's a tremendous character, you know. I didn't expect any of this. You know, I, there were times during my imprisonment that, you know, I wondered if I ever would have got out. I always believed I would get out because I always had faith in human beings. And I think that when you lose faith in and your fellow citizens, it's the worst. And, I, I, and, and there was just something that I thought English people were a little bit above this. You know, we're all appalled by, by terrible, uh, terrible tragedies and, and stuff like that. And I, I didn't know when I was going to get out. But my, father's, my father, Dan, in jail sort of changed the dynamics of it. Because by the time he died, Cardinal Hume had come on board, Cardinal Brady come on board, Cardinal O'Feed come on board with politicians coming from across the board to wanting to help. And, and it then became a case of when, not if. And my biggest concern was when I got out was what could I do to help the other innocent people who were left behind, such as the Birmingham Six, such as the Tottenham Three, such as the Card Bridgewater Four. You know, there are a lot of people in there and it's, it's the worst thing that can happen. So when I got out, I didn't expect, you know, I was surprised by the amount of interest. But it was the first time that the British judicial system had really been taken to task, where people started to question it and question its integrity and its reliability. And I, you know, my prime concern was what could I do to highlight the case of the others left behind? But within a matter of weeks, someone had offered me a book deal. And there had been several books written about us while we were in prison, as had been for the Birmingham Six and the Bridgewater case. So I wrote the book, you know, because my solicitor thought people needed to know what had gone wrong here. And, and I also wanted justice because I spent 15 years in jail. And they took me to the appeal court and they let me out within four hours. You know, they kept me for 15 years and they dealt with me in four hours, which are, it was criminal in itself because the people who tortured me were still in positions of power. Peter Rimbert became head of the Metropolitan Police. Maggie Thatcher made him a sir. Tony Blair, when he came to power, made him a lord. Uh, Donaldson, the trial judge, came from the Industrial Tribunal Court to try us. Second criminal trial was us. They ended up making him master of the roles, the second highest legal position in the country. They made his wife Mary the Lord Mayor of London, the only woman ever to be made Lord Mayor. And Michael Havers, who prosecuted us. First of all, Maggie Thatcher made him uh, Attorney General, and then she made him Lord Chancellor. So they, they had rewarded people. They had rewarded members of the establishment for sending innocent people to jail. And I wanted to, to get out there and tell them that was wrong. And that's why even today, Donaldson's still alive, Embert's still alive, Havers is dead. But everywhere I go, I mention all the policemen who tortured me. I mention all the policemen who perjured themselves and fabricated evidence. I mention the forensic scientist Higgs and Lidstead and Hayes who fabricated evidence against the Birmingham Six along with, along with Scoos. And also, Hayes and Higgs and Lidstead were involved in Lockerbie. Fifteen years after they framed innocent people for Guildford, they're framing innocent people for, for Lockerbie. 
People need to be held account for their actions. So when I got out, I wanted to expose the myth that British justice was the best in the world, that was the fairest in the world. It's not a bad judicial system if it's applied properly. The unfortunate thing is, when it's not applied properly, it becomes tainted and it becomes corrupt. And it allows policemen to do things that they shouldn't be allowed to do. It puts them above the law and nobody's above the law. And we need, we need, when we find that people have behaved wrongly, that we charge them and we try them. Singing is something that found me. I, n I never really set out and thought, right, I'm going to be a singer. I didn't know any other singers. I didn't think it was a, a, a possible job to have at all. But it's, it's a strange thing because I shouldn't be a singer at all because I grew up really without much music in the house at all. Uh, no one was a professional musician or any of that. So, I don't know, it's a mixture of kind of instinct and naivety and uh, a little bit of bravery and getting up and singing in, in like local places and other people saying, God, you, sh you know, you should do that. You should sing. You should be a singer. So it was a kind of other people prompting me to do it. And then I sang right here where we're standing now in Clonard Monastery. When I was 14 and 15 and all that, I joined a local version of the choir here. And I ended up singing right here in this spot, facing that way. Um, say at Easter or Christmas when I was about 15 years old before my voice kind of changed. So... I had a mixture of doing kind of religious things because the only output for a singer at that point in, in the community I grew up in was in a religious context, at chapel, in weddings, all of those kinds of things. So certainly Clonard Monastery was one of the first places that I heard my voice ring out into a big building like that and it's, it's like you hear your voice for the very first time. Well obviously I'm back, I'm still in building, I'm constructing and I'm looking at a number of investment in different sites. Hopefully that uh, I'm at something at the minute in relation to uh, bring a work on the road. And without going into great detail, hopefully it'll, there'll be a couple of uh, projects that'll hopefully that'll help children like yourself fulfil their dreams on the road. So we're looking at apprentices and we're trying to encourage people to invest in the youth. The music industry was really difficult to get into because there was no sense of it in Belfast at the time. Um, we had already been defined so politically at that time that because I came from Belfast, the first thing that anybody associated with my accent was trouble, was was you know, that kind of thing. So it was clear to me that what I had to do, like so many of my generation, was to leave Belfast and go and either go to London or America. London was cheaper and closer, and that's what I ended up doing. And that started what became a kind of a four-year search to finally end up uh, with a recording deal with RCA and all of that. But it was, a, it was an uphill struggle, for sure. Well, I, I was a councillor for 23 years. I'd come up through the, the whole quest, and I was, uh, you'd ask earlier on, uh, about people that stood out and, and influenced me. And that later in life, you know, you have uh, the 1981 hunger strikers, you have Bobby Sands, uh, you have all the volunteers that I knew who were friends who had been shot dead or died in, uh, in, in, in the struggle or in the war. Uh, but uh, and, and after uh, the, the, the hunger strike and that we went into our areas and started to organise, you know, as, when I was elected a councillor, the... Uh, it's what you can physically get on the ground. Um, the likes of the Falls Leisure Centre. You know, I done a deal with the unionists uh, that got the Falls Leisure Centre built. I guaranteed him that I would get our 14 votes within Belfast City Council to support the rebuilding of Grove Leisure Centre if he could guarantee me uh, the uh, 14, or his votes from his party uh, for the rebuilding of Falls. So it's things like that that I can physically see uh, that, that, that you get done. I'm really proud of it because I do believe uh, even for its size, it's one of the better leisure centres in Belfast. It's well used locally. Uh, I also, uh, along with a number of local people, have this, uh, have this uh, vision uh, of the, the likes of Dunville Park, what it can become. So uh, with the local committee's meeting, I went away to the council again and uh, about two years ago that I uh, was able to convince the council. I met a unionist politician again and uh, both of us argued the case and I got a million pound for Donville Park and with another million pound coming through uh, from uh, the Department of Social Development and there'll be a major programme of work that totally transformed uh, Donville Park and it 
was one of one of the 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 I have dealt with many of the house. Most of a big lot of the housing that exists in the area have been one of the ones that that has argued and uh, pushed the whole thing. Uh, for new housing to be built in better conditions for people uh, to, to live in. There had been a number of different campaigns that took place for the demolition of Divis Flats. Uh, the, I think the first one uh, probably would have been organised by the, 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 the Lower Falls Residents Association. Uh, they had first raised the idea back in the early 70s. Then you had the Divis Demolition Camp uh, Committee uh, that was formed, I, I think it might have been in the uh, late 70s. Um, you had Sean Stitt who recently died, Frank Gill and George Gill who have both uh, passed on, Aveline Gill who's now passed on, uh, you had Aileen Trainer. Uh, you had quite a number of people there who formed the base of what was known as the Divis Demolition Committee. And uh, at that time the conditions in uh, the flats were atrocious. You know, so what 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 they done was that the housing executive and the government refused to dem said that they refused to demolish the flats, and what they believed was that as soon as someone moved out of a, a flat, they would go in and wreck it, so that it couldn't be allocated to anyone else. So they believed that over a period of time, uh, that there would be that many flats blacked up that they would have to demolish all the flats. What happened there is that uh, the RUC had come in, raided the offices of the. Uh, the Divis Demolition Committee took away all their files and arrested, arrested the senior people who were run it. I was in prison at the time, I hadn't get, uh, been released yet. And uh, they were all charged with uh, malicious damage. And uh, eventually uh, they, 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 they beat the charge. But it was what the judge had said at the time uh, that he, he found it uh, incredible that a group of people have had to come together uh, under circumstances. Uh, of the conditions that they lived in to try and make life better for people. So it was a severe criticism of the, uh, of the, uh, the housing executive and the British government uh, at the time. Uh, we came into the Residence Association about 1983, I believe it may have been, or 84, maybe 83. And uh, that our main objective, uh, low conditions were, were poor uh, within Divis. Our, 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 main con our main objective was uh, the total demol demolition of flats. Uh, we set about organising uh, a campaign uh, to highlight uh, the terrible uh, conditions that existed within the flats. And uh, over a four year period, uh, we were able to build up a campaign uh, that eventually led to the flats. But it's what happened uh, with the, within the, the four years that that campaign went on. We had a number of projects that we set up within the flats, uh, the likes of Crazy Joe School, uh, for, for young people who were expelled out of uh, the, the, the mainstream schools, as, as they get called. So but, but what you had, uh, you had uh, a number of projects that, that were set up by the Tivis Residents Association, and they, they then became a group known as the Tivis Joint Development Committee that actually still exists today and uh, were responsible for getting the Frank Gillen Centre uh, built uh, a number of years ago. But what you had is that you had uh, a, a, a canteen or a cafe where people would have went in and got dinners uh, cheap. Uh, you had a, the Divis Drop-In Centre uh, that uh, was held in uh, old housing executive stores. You had photographic uh, a photographic uh, subcommittee to teach people how to use cameras. Uh, you had uh, a workshop there that where people could go and do work on their an employment scheme that we had going. So the, the whilst the, the conditions in Divis were atrocious and terrible, uh, that there was a, such a very strong, strong community spirit uh, within it. And I think at that time, the, the, the Divis community were the only community within the city of Belfast uh, that uh, had control of uh, in many ways their own destiny, uh, that everything was pitched against them. There was unemployment, there was poverty, uh, the, there was at the outside Divis, that the, the statutory authorities uh, never put any money into the place, uh, you had poor conditions in housing. But in doing that, I think what you had is that people came together to create conditions that the statutory authorities uh, wouldn't fund. Many things we've seen in Divis over the years 
we'd have been joining, people would have joined the Fena a long, long time ago. And uh, we thought it was like the Scouts. It was far from the Scouts. So there was, there was much, was telling, everybody from the flats would have played football and probably joined the Fena at some stage. I like about our community the spirit that they had when the troubles was on. People were um, always looking out for one another. They cared about the community. I think with the age of the internet and the web and stuff that's coming now is, that seems to be displaced, that care in our community. Um, what I dislike about our community is, we need to encourage the young, like yourself, who's a dream that wants to be in media, like your Chloe, maybe wants to be an actress. We have to encourage our kids. We need to get out and encourage them and give them the guidance to push on. I think our community could be doing a lot more, and I don't want to be critical of our politicians here. But when I see 800 million being spent in East Belfast and 20 million being spent in West Belfast, it makes me think. We need investment in our community. We need to give the kids a future. I got involved in community work around here. By the way, I'm voluntary community work, but I got involved around here because when I bought my first house here in 33 Distillery Street, this was a mixed area. Protestant Catholic, quite a nice area to live in, but like that poor housing. But then the troubles came. And you, as you know what happened during the Troubles, everybody moved here, there and everywhere. So we ended up in the area with uh, about 70-80% of blocked up housing. So then we were put under redevelopment. So that's initially how I got involved in housing, through redevelopment of the Gravener Road. It was the thing that kept me going through, through all the hard times was knowing where I came from. They were the most friendliest people in, in the world. Every door was open. You could walk in and get a, a bread and butter and uh, sugar sandwich or a, or a jam sandwich of anyone. People were friendly with. There was a real community spirit where people helped each other because they were all in, this, in the same position. You know, it was a struggling community that had been deprived economically and socially for, for years. And the thing that glued it together was the warmth of the community that they felt for each other and they looked out for each other. It was a, an amazing place to grow up. It, the, the Falls Road, I wouldn't have, if I could live my life over, I would want to go back and be born there again in the same conditions with the same wonderful people. The Falls Road was a very, uh, <laughs> it's a very interesting place to grow up. Um, it was very uh, dangerous. It was very uh, friendly. It was certainly there was a sense of community when things got really bad. In terms of when, say, the first of when Bobby Sands first died. I'm thinking just now, the sense of grief that came to the community, the bin lids banging off the ground, all of that stuff, that everybody seemed to know what to do without speaking about it. So there was an, an unspoken. Uh, I suppose support going on there and also just the day to day things like someone would send round for a bowl of sugar somebody else would have you know send in for a few rounds of bread or borrow half a pound of butter or so. so there was always that sort of barter system going on too particularly between the women um, so I do I remember all of those things that any little working class community would probably have. Growing up through it was quite um, obscure on some parts of it other parts of it were nice to grow up in because people looked after each other, looked after each other's needs in all our areas. We were very, very tight communities growing up through the Troubles. Unfortunately, when the Troubles finished, it didn't continue like that were neighbourhoods. It's like, man, look after yourself. Where I really do think the Troubles was marvellous for people looking out for each other. And we didn't have all they all right, you had bombs, bullets, whatever, but you didn't have the antisocial element that you have now. There's three things that every child who has been born and will be born has no control over. It can't pick its parents, can't pick the colour of its skin, and it can't pick the wrong on the social letter it's brought up in. And what I, uh, it's, I, I don't think you could say dislike, uh, regret is probably more that we didn't think enough of ourselves growing up as being capable of being anything. I mean, we just didn't have the opportunities. So I think whether when you're deprived and you don't have the opportunities, you some way feel a little bit inferior in that, you know. But most of these people who, who are great actors and great directors and all the rest, 
they've come from a family that's been well established in it. Whereas when I was growing up, if your father worked at the docks, you inherently got a job at the docks. It's called nepotism. I think, you know, what I loved about my community was the camaraderie, the togetherness, the kindness, the warmth, the sincerity, and the humour. Uh, you know, uh, outstanding. I'm really, really proud of the community that I live in. I've grown up in it. Uh, I know most of the people in it. I know that it's, it's very difficult, especially in today's, uh, the, the, the ten, what happens today. Uh, it's difficult for people uh, to, 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 to cope and deal with the thing. Um, I, so I'm really, really proud of where I come from. And uh, I've spent most of my working life uh, outside prison uh, trying to make conditions better uh, w w within the area uh, from the early days of helping to get Divis flats demolished and replaced with the houses we all live in uh, now. Uh, so I am proud and, and, and continuously work to try and make things better. And uh, What I dislike is people who are hell-bent and trying to destro destroy the area that they live in, either through vandalism or through criminality or through drugs, uh, because what it does, it pollutes the area. And uh, what is once, and, uh, well, and it still is, to a degree, a very proud area with a proud people, uh, has cont continuously been brought down by a small number of people who live within the area. I think growing up in West Belfast in the Falls Road could only have influenced me in every way, because at that point, when you're a young person, you know, my whole world was the Falls Road. I didn't know anything else. I didn't have another childhood. Um, I'd never really been outside of it, so I, I think it influences every inch of you. It influ I think emotions are like accents, so the way then in which I would have uh, had a strong West Belfast accent as a little boy, I also would have had very strong reactions to certain things given my experience of how I grew up, how terrifying it was, how scary it was, and how funny it was sometimes. There was probably one incident where there was a, I was asked, I had a motorbike, it was a Yamaha Yeti, and I was asked to go over to the other side of the streets, would have been the Lower Falls, to collect something. And there was a lot of girls sitting about, and I had a motorbike, I was about 16. I didn't know how to drive it, and I shot it across Albert Street. Unfortunately, it didn't impress anybody. I had a wall, went over a wall, and everybody had a quirt off, including all the girls I was trying to impress. So that's one story that happened to me from the past that was humorous. One of the ones that stands out, which probably was serious, but funny, and the reason I'll, I'll tell you why it is serious, the seriousness of it is, I was on Cooper Street one day, and I was standing outside my cousin's door, on oh, McParland, and I stepped out of the hall and looked up at Cooper Street, and at that door, a guy called Sean Ross met him, threw what he thought was a ball of muck, which I know that he didn't think it was a ball of muck, it was a half a brick in it, and it hit me up the face, and I ended up in the hall, with blood flying out of me, my eye closed over in black and blue. That was very, very serious. And Anne and Noel, young Noel McPartland, came out, they were wasting it all away, you were alright, blah, blah, blah. And Sean Ross bought him run away. And Sean Ross bought him his knife, 42. And I'm a professional heavyweight fighter, and every time I see him, I go, I haven't forgot about that brick. <laughs> so <laughs> there's the funny and serious one. I have a million of them, but there not be one come to mind. Because if you sit in here every day doing community work, everything that comes in over this door is funny. <laughs> well, when I went to St Malachy's at 11 years of age, my mum, who's dead now, was Nellie Rooney, and Fra's mum was Ruby, Ruby McCann. The two of them were two dinner ladies, and they run about in the CDC, which is Citizens Defence Committee. I passed my 11 plus at 11 that I had to walk over to school in Millfield. Well, as I told you about those Protestant gangs, the Tartan gangs used to beat us up. Fra McCann, our MLA of the area, was about 21, 22 at the time, and he was working in the Irish News as a printer. So Fra used to have to walk me from Divis straight across, down Divis Street, across Millfield. And when we got to the bottom of Clifton Street, he turned right when he knew it was safe from went to St Peter's, or went, sorry, to the Irish News, and I went up to St Malachy's. The Arthur Rooney, on some occasions, offered us services. I had a, I had a drink with Arthur, and I bet you was him said that, was it? The, uh, and Arthur, uh, Arthur a, a couple of times when we went out for a drink, told everybody that he was my bodyguard. Was too ugly to be my bodyguard. 
Unfortunately for I then was arrested, put in jail and put in the blocks. So then I had to get another bodyguard called Anthony Irvin, who done it for him. The two of them still tease me and say to me, we got you educated. You always remember that. And that's true. That's a true story about them boys. My hopes and plans for the future are that Belfast just keeps gathering strength in the way that it is and changing before my eyes. I get lost in my own hometown, it's funny, and that's a good thing because it means it's not familiar anymore and the past is getting further and further away. Um, my own hopes are that I continue to be a singer and a writer and a happy fellow. I think I'll retire when I'm 29 and uh, the future. I'm present, well, obviously not with the cold, as you can see, I've got the cold in a minute, and I've had to have training there for, for four days. I'm hoping to be European champion this year. I'm hoping to be, Euro I'm going to fight, hopefully fight for the European title very soon. Be Irish champion, European champion, and then fight for the world title. That's what my belief is, and that's what I think I'll do. But I have to train very, very hard. It doesn't just get handed to you, so... You gonna be able to support me? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, the new construction firm, the new construction firm, Green City Construction Limited. Hopefully, that it gets to the same levels as what Rooney Brothers did 10, 20 years ago. Hopefully, that it'll get back and be very profitable again and then reinvest in our community. That's what I'd hope to do. But again, it'll all be dictated to by what happens in relation to Stormont and the money that filters down into our community. My hopes for the community is and. I a wee bit more jobs for our young people, for our young people to feel a bit of ownership of where they live. Sometimes all the negatives that I see about drugs and all is through children's lack of um, choices for jobs. There's no jobs for our young people. They need, they need to get a job, God love them, get a wee bit of wage, give them a wee bit of pride, which is something we're very, very lacking in, in our communities now. Nobody knows what life brings. Um, my whole life from when I was 15 years of age has been de devoted towards uh, trying to, uh, to, to get a United Ireland. And uh, that has always been one of the prime forces that has moved me on. And I would like to see United Ireland uh, within my lifetime. Um, I would also obviously work, continue to work uh, toward, towards that end. Uh, but I would also... Along with that, I'd like to see to live in an area uh, where young people uh, don't fear uh, going, out, going out of their communities, uh, where there's full unemployment uh, within it so people, so people uh, can, can get on in life, that uh, the education system uh, is better so that people can get educated. In relation to Ireland, the United Ireland, I, don't think, I think we're, we're, we're a people in a country that's quite capable of looking over, looking after, and looking over our own people without foreign interference. You know, I think imperialism, colonialism, is a is an evil that's got to be eradicated, and that's what's happening here. And it's and I work with people from the Shankle Road here trying to get justice for our families. Same way I work with Raymond McCord, who's trying to get justice for his families. But going to jail politicised me, made me realise. How, how good it was to be Irish, how, and, and, and I've, I have a real pride in that. The, I'd like to see the courts become more transparent around the world. I'd like to see uh, an improvement in human rights situations. I'd like to see uh, a better understanding and tolerance of minority communities. Uh, I'd like to repeal the Official Secrets Act around British prisons and around prisons here in the north of Ireland because why do we need an Official Secrets Act around prisons anywhere if we're not performing bad deeds within them? And I'd also like to see a system that when people are sent to prison and there is a need for prison, make no mistake about that, the same as there is a need for the police. But I'd like to see when people go to prison that when they enter the prison system, first and foremostly, they're given an, they're assessed for their education abilities, and they're educated, and they're rehabilitated, and they're given vocational training, and they're given work schemes to go on. And I don't think any prisoner should be paroled without coming out, without learning something. I think it's really important. I think 
this revolving door that we have, this demonization is putting people outside of society has to end. If you treat somebody bad in prison and they can't react within the prison, the first thing they're going to do is react when they get out. And it's usually the young or the old or the vulnerable who fall for that. We have to send people out of prison more aware and in a better mindset than what they want in. My generation growing up on the Falls Road, we didn't have a huge drug problem. We didn't have HIV. We didn't have all these things that now young people are, are really concerned with. Drugs weren't easy to buy. Uh, there were, certainly drink, drinking was a huge problem when we, when we were little kids, but again, I think there was more of a sense of being terrified that you'd be caught and the punishment that would come. I think every, uh, any city that I've ever been in, the youth often get demonised wrongly and rightly, depending on what has happened, but I think that you know, every generation has got to find its own way. I can't believe all of the things that young people have to cope with now. The technology, the, the terror of new diseases, the, the new drugs that are being invented all the time that are instantly addictive and then the troubles that come with that. So, I mean, I think there's nothing that different from, um, from this generation of young people. It's just the components are different, that's all. Uh, although I left school when I was 15 and have no further education from that, uh, people who same streetways, I think probably one of the most important things in life for a young person to get is that wee piece of paper that says that uh, they've graduated, but it opens doors that are not, that would be closed to everybody else. I think that's one of the most important things. And I think one of the things over this past 30 years or 40 years for people uh, that allowed niceness to move in, uh, move on in life, and uh, is uh, the, the fact that they went into further education and uh, opened the doors that normally wouldn't have been open to them. Retrospectively looking back, I love football and I played for several times. I played for the Mac, I played for the Newsboys, I, I played in jail. And part of getting being a good athlete is the training. And I'd like to say to young people, Part of life is learning, your education. Your education is your training to get into a good job. We need role models. We need people here in West Belfast, in Belfast, in the north of Ireland, in Ireland as a whole, that can inspire young people. And I think education is the way out of social deprivation. And your training at school helps you get a good career. And we should realize that it's not our fault and it's not our parents' fault that we were born socially and economically deprived. But if we educate ourselves, we can be an inspiration to the community and we can change things. This is what you, you, I would love for most young people to take on board what yous are doing. And then I think if you do what yous are doing, it keeps you away from all the things that bring our young people down, but it's it's roping people into doing what yous are doing. I think the youth of the day get bad press. I think that uh, many of the, the media outlets, newspapers and things, that they're more interested in the negativity of that goes on in an area around looking at the positives of what happens actually in there. I think those that are involved in anti-community activity uh, are only a small nucleus of people uh, that do it. So you've always great pride and be uh, very optimistic uh, that, that, that things would, would change. And you look at the likes of uh, the, some of the people uh, that live in the area uh, that, that have made journaling cues from across the Gravener, who's an actress, acted in some of the thing, Martin McCann, uh, seen him on the, 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 in the Irish News yesterday, and uh, really, really proud. You know, uh, the, 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 the other people uh, there the, that uh, come up through the boxing trade, come up through the acting trade, and uh, so you're really, really proud uh, of like, Martin Lindsay, uh, really, really proud of him. And uh, you have people that also uh, stand out there, the likes of the Nugget Nugent's of this world, uh, who run the Amagalata, the Chips Fusco's of this world, uh, who are totally dedicated uh, to, to, to what they do. And I like to, uh, you know, you, you really like to see people uh, move, moving on towards it. No, just uh, I'd like to thank everybody that's 
supported me. He said, all my boxing, all everybody, especially kids and all that, that have got something out of it. You know, the fact that they see me boxing, believe that they can do it. They want to be like me, or they, they don't want to be like me, or just as long as I've done something good. But my boxing, you know, everything you do in life is a reason behind it, and I hope that the reason behind my boxing is hopefully gets a couple of kids on the street that are even adults as well that, that have felt pretty down and I don't want to do nothing then maybe I've given them a wee bit of inspiration and changed their way of thinking and and hopefully it does that there for future years to come and just thank everybody for their support through the years even the ones that didn't believe me are the ones that believe me now so hopefully I can do something for everybody and hopefully I can help everybody and just thank everybody for their for being there probably uh, and in, in, in our lives, we're quite often inclined to uh, look back back at uh, your life uh, with rose-tinted glasses in many ways. But I think our whole community, uh, not only for the past 40 years, but probably from the foundation of the state, uh, has, has suffered uh, great deals. And you you often uh, sideline that. And uh, at some t at some stage, you know, we 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 I I would certainly constantly reflect on it. And there are actually times there where I would uh, you would feel a bit depressed, or you would just say, "What's the use?" You know, the times like that, there you you would end up going up into the graveyard, and you would walk around the Republican plot. Uh, you would go to friends' graves who've been shot dead. You know, and you take great strength. Uh, from the, their sacrifice, because I think it's uh, it's important. I think your identity is important, your nationality is, imp uh, is important, and I think that probably for myself, the most important thing, as I said earlier, earlier on, is uh, just continuing what you're doing to ensure uh, that at some stage in the future, and hopefully in the near future, that uh, Ireland becomes a free country again. I would like to. Uh pay a huge thank you to everybody who's participated in the programme, especially the young people, the staff, Eclipso Pictures, Divis U Project, Integrated Services, and I would also like to pay tribute to our funders who help finance this.